The Apex Igbo Social Cultural Organization, or Haneze in the Igbo, as well as some religious leaders have called on the federal government to allow the Southeast to establish their security outfit to be known as Operation Ogbunigwe. And while this is happening, the Sultan of Sokoto, al Haji Sahad Abubakar, has told traditional rulers to speak out about the problems of the country. And joining me still in the studio to discuss this is political analyst Sam Adelike. Thank you, Sam, for Thank staying you. with us still. Now, the Sultan of Sokoto, Sahad Abubakar, has told traditional rulers to speak out about the problems of the country. What roles do you think they have to play with the myriad of issues surrounding us right now? The monarchy system, you know, in Nigeria has predated or definitely has predated the political system here. Yes. Before independence, before we had the regions and before we had the presidential system of government, we've had these traditional rulers rule and preside over their individual kingdoms for years. Territories, yes. Territories. And they have been so absolute. But over time, you know, these powers have been dissipated and diluted primarily because of the influence and the power of the governor, I mean governments, because they are the ones that now fund these institutions. And you know, he who dictates or he who pays, he who pays the piper, piper that takes the dictates tune. the tune, you know. And for someone like the Sultan to have made this pronouncement, it's, there's no smoke without fire. He has been We're, vocal of late. He has the Sultan of Sokot has been vocal it, it, of late. It used yes. to be Emir, Emir of Kano. Kano. You know, now Sultan has taken over. And I, I think it's a good development because apparently the, 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 the things are falling apart. We can no longer lie to ourselves that things and all that all is well. So I, I believe that we should all take a cue from him. Because if men like this who are iconic and who are symbolic do not speak. And for them to have said, oh, I don't want to speak alone, you guys, let's speak as well. So it's going to be a case of, oh, why is Sultan speaking before they now Trump bring up a charge against him? Yeah. So if you have like 20, 50 of them across the country, and there are lots of traditional rulers, yes. a lot of them, Yoruba land, in the north, the east, everywhere. So if everyone is speaking on a daily basis, it will put pressure on this government to do the obvious, to do what is right. So I, I think he is, is doing what's, what you should have done you know, all, all, all along. Now, while he was speaking, he did accuse the elite of using the common man who doesn't have anything to get what they want. Mm. Now, what is your reaction to this statement? <laughs> because this is like people sitting in the corridors of power right. and letting loose the dogs of vandalism mm. to wreak havoc on, on the people. How do you, you react to this? You know, s such, such voices are important, like I said earlier, and I, I'm grateful for the voice of reason, but the question is, some will just say, oh, just wave it aside, you know, the, the, the man has to say what he has to say. Because such statements must not just go without corresponding action. He should call for prosecution. He should institute cases. So for example, look at the late Ghani Fahim, look at even the Femi Falano. When they have issues with the federal government and they know the so-called elites who are responsible for the atrocities, for the impunities, for the mismanagement of funds, just like the Abia example. Yes. Don't just call them out. Don't just generalize. Don't just give cliches and make statements that are sound bites. Institute cases. Take them to court. Sue the government. You know, challenge these things. Call summits. Uh, uh, write editorials, you know, don't just make statements and just, okay, yeah, I said it, and so what? Who is the elite? Who are the elites? Mm. Name names. Let's, let, let, let's have a process whereby you follow through and not just have a talk shop. This will really show that, yes, you mean what you say, and as you say what a you mean. A talk shop, like you call it, where he <laughs> rightly said when he was speaking that we the elites, he actually personalized to so say mm. we the elites are the cause of the problem, that we know what the problem is. And the earlier we start speaking and fixing the problem, the better it becomes for our country. Now, is this so much of a governance problem or a leadership problem or a failure of leadership? Leadership, leadership. And I would, do, I would say that leadership by example is the best form of leadership because an example is worth a thousand words. You can't just say, we the elites. Let's start from you, in your kingdom. What is the condition of education? Because if you do not educate the masses, you cannot leave them out of poverty. If you do not empower them, if you do not ensure that these people, children are the out of school numbers are dropping, that uh, marriages of underage children are yeah. dropping, these are numbers that you should say, oh, 
as a, as a sultan in my 20 years of reign, within 2019, 2020, I've been able to reduce child mortality, out of school children, yes. child marriage. Tell us, don't just, don't just say we're the elite. Don't, don't play to the gallery. Don't give us um, editorials or, 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 or things to talk about. Let us have figures and numbers. And even if you don't have in the past, you give us a roadmap that, okay, now I've said we're the elite, but in the north, where I'm coming from, this is our plan for the next five years. In my capacity as the sultan, I'm going to influence the northern leaders, the governors, to throw this part. Practical steps. Practical, practical steps. solutions. You know, so that is the way to go, not just this sand bites we're hearing from this. Oh, interestingly, the traditional rulers were known for centuries to manage the affairs of their territories mm -hmm. before the government actually kind of relegated them to the background after the 1914 amalgamation. Now, what do you think these traditional rulers need to come together now to start doing to occupy their space as traditional rulers because they are like, they're like fathers. They, they should have a voice, they should speak, and they should be heard and listened to. A traditional ruler can only earn respect when he himself does not partake in the loot from the Commonwealth. You think they've been compromised? Apparently, because if, if um, you go to courts or go to National Assembly or the House of Assembly and you are telling them that, oh, create five more orbers to, <laughs> to dilute your power. That simply means that, number one, you are building to them. They are the ones paying you. And then oh, with the money you are paying, and they see the kind of life it's that you are living. You are living more than your means. How is the orbar earning? How are the sultans? How are the traditional? What's their, what's their income? Because th these, are, these are factors that we cannot over overlook. So if they are able to achieve some level of financial independence, I don't, I'm, I'm talking in an ideal situation. Yes. But if they're able to detach themselves from that and that, and that pay, from being on the payroll of government, then that independence will give them that leverage to be able to speak to power and then power would listen to them. Now, the Sultan said, and I quote, you cannot have peace and security when you do not have good governance and justice. Mm. Without justice, you can't have good governance. That is what our forefather said. We need to rise to the occasion. Things are really bad. End of quote. <laughs> governance. Governance is multi-layered. At the same time, it is the person that controls the money, that controls the power and controls security that really, really has the burden of governance. The, the traditional rulers can only talk, they can only have the paraphernalia of power because they're the custodians of culture. You know, we have the festivals, we have the, you know, the respect and all that, but if they cannot order their, their bodyguard or the, or the police to arrest this person, prosecute this person, if they don't have the apparatus of, ju of justice and, and, and security, they really can't do much. So I, I think it's about moral situation. It's about being able to use their moral standing, their, their integrity, their capacity as fathers to be able to compel um, the, 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 the people who hold the apparatus of power. Because yes. if not, they would just be talking, they would just talk and talk and talk, and then the governor would just dangle the FCC at them and then keep quiet. So I think that is the way they can influence governors if they themselves come to equity with clean hands. Now, um, recently there's been a whole lot of setting up of um, security outfits and regional security <laughs> outfits. Don't you think the, gov the governor can actually get this monarchs involved in this um, creation of these outfits for effective community policing. Shouldn't, I, I, I shouldn't monarchs be involved in all of this? In fact, they are involved already. You know, um, the Southwest example is there for us to see. The Onye of Ife, yes. you know, led every other um, governor to that inauguration. And I was privileged to be, to be a guest of the Oni um, last month during the Royal Leadership Youth Awards, where I was one of the awardees. And in the palace in Ife, the, the, the monuments of the Amotekun were actually all over. Yeah. So I was like, oh, okay, so this is where they drew the inspiration from, because only as a progenitor of the, of the Yoruba race. Now, they were proactive. They didn't wait and ask for permission from the federal government. So th that's why this issue of restructuring, so to speak, it will organically evolve. And that's why when, when we had the ONEZE in Digbo asking yes. for permission, you don't ask for permission to protect yourselves. You, it will come naturally. So th that is why you, you, if, if you are using one mouth to say, oh, we are working with the police or community policing, and then the owner, or, or NAZ, that's governors are saying that, and then the traditional people are now saying, oh, we want permission to do this. No, you, it's a federating system. Even though we know that it is not truly federal because power is drawn from the center, yes. everyone should be able to protect itself. Every governor's responsibility is to 
primarily secure the people of their state. So I think that everyone should look at the Southwest example and let all the leaders come together and evolve and develop something that will be in collaboration with the federal government and also will be passed into law, just like Ikitia sets the example. So now, it's interesting you did go there already. I was going to come to that. Now, the Apex Igbo Culture, Social Cultural Organization, or oh, Anise Indibo, as well as some religious leaders on Wednesday called on the federal government to allow the Southeast to establish their own security outfit to be known as Operation Ogbunigwe. Now, it seems every region is creating its own security mm -hmm. outfit. Isn't this dangerous to the fact that we are a federation? It is, 100%. At the same time, it is, it is complementary because if you, as a federal government, with all the resources, we have less than one million policemen, police officers in Nigeria, policing over 190 million people. We have um, people who are not being paid properly. We have the ratio of policemen to citizens at a very high, it's, it's about one policeman to 400,000 people, yeah. which, is, which is so ridiculous. Now, the obvious, the, the police is even poorly funded, and we see how the barracks are poorly managed. Police stations that, 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 that do not have stationaries. Policemen are poorly paid. These people do not even have fuel to fuel their cars. You know, so these realities stare us in the face. And there is so much corruption. It, as, what, that, that's why after every IG leaves the office, there are always guests of the EFCC. Yeah. You know, some people have been siphoning the money that should have been used to develop and professionalize the police over time. In fact, we need more policemen. We need more people to be in the force, but they're they not recruited as, as they ought to be. So these things naturally is born out of responsibility. People who are beginning to take arms and arm themselves. People are beginning to take uh, our vigilantes. And then the government of the regions thought about the fact, okay, why not let's make this more professional? Why not let's make this more formal? So I think it's a naturally evolving um, instinct to self-preserve itself because part of the human <laughs> character is self-preservation. So if the federal government whose responsibility is to secure everyone is failing, definitely people will, will preserve themselves. So that's what's happening here. Okay, now that's, that's a big concern. I mean, regionalism of this security outfit. Hmm. Some people have said, I mean, some social commentators out there have said, this is Nigeria eventually disintegrating, that this is all going our separate ways. And there's been concerns about when the Amotekum started, um, and S.Y. Governor Kaduna State Balabe Musa said um, the federal government should not allow this to go through because it's a ploy ultimately for them to create their own country. <laughs> and now the, the South, the East, the Easterners, the Northerners, everybody's trying to create their own security outfit. Do, do you see a case of anarchy here? There's only one person to blame. And that is the key man in charge of this country. Because the commander in chief is the one who we should ask that, Oga, why are things falling apart in your house? Everyone is bringing up their own security outfit because they want to protect and preserve their lives. You know, so if there are the legitimate fears about Nigeria be disintegrated. It is everyone has a right to 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 pursue self. Um, what's, what, what's the word now? Self um, actualization. Okay. That that's the word. So I, I think these are real fears, and th these are conversations that should not just be had on TV or radio and papers alone, but also in the legal houses of assembly, House of Representatives, the Senate. Let's talk about the fact that. See the implications of you know securing your people. They will go their own way and they will secure themselves. So I think it is important, and that's why I appreciate what the Senate just did today in the papers of today, whereby they are they are dusting um, up the reports of the national conference that was called by Jonathan, President Jonathan, in um, 2014. So I think this is a wake up call to every leader, to everyone in this country who is a political leader that, yes, let's talk about our existence as a country. We should stop um, sweeping this under the carpet. Just like the way Rwanda, I, I love remarkable Rwanda, I, I've been there twice, they, 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 they do not hide their past. They have monuments that remind them of the genocide in 1994. So everyone is reminded of where they are coming from. But Nigeria likes to, you know, bury our head in the sand like ostriches. So it's important that we talk about the things that can threaten our national coexistence. So I think this is a good development that will make us really sit together and talk about the fact that should we go ahead together as one or should we go our separate ways? You know, it's not so much about all of this um, regions creating their own security outfit. It's the major concerns at the end of the day. Like just yesterday, we were told um, the Amotekun, there was a bill that was passed. And in that bill, some of the things contained in the bill um, seem to be protecting 
the, the security personnel themselves. Like if you are cost um, an Amotekun um, security personnel, you, you'll be billed 250,000 Naira. And the cost of discharging that duty, they will not be held liable for whatever they do. Now, that modus operandi, MO, mm. we want to know how will it be regulated? How will should at the end of the day? Because even the cost of that duty, they decide to mob somebody, um, they won't be held liable. This is still jungle justice that we all know we're trying to fight against. So the operation of this security outfit is very key. Right. And how we show at the end of the day, the whole process will not be hijacked. The current apparatus... Who takes control? <laughs> the, the, the current apparatus we have right now, the police, the army, the navy, the NSDCC and others, they're currently abusing Nigerians. Nigerians. We, we, we see, I've, I've personally been a victim of high-handedness, of how they rough -hand do you, how they lie on you, how they seize your cars, how they abuse power and authority. It's happening already with those who we have at the moment. So the fact that that will not happen is a given. It's, it will happen. But the point thing is for us to strengthen the laws. So. It's like building a new tech product in which you have to go and test the markets. Then you iterate as, as the days unfold. Yeah. So it's important that let's, let's let this law go and let it pass and then we test it. And then, and, and then we'll come to readjust the laws. We, just like you amend the Act of Constitution. Yes. You know, it, because every law that challenges constitution should always be challenged itself. You know, so I, I do not think that we should always be um, afraid or we should fret when a new development comes because we cannot have a perfect situation all the time. So it's we keep changing things, we keep, keep getting adjusted. And of course, the judiciary, we always, you know, hold them accountable yes. and always, you know, um, try and interpret the laws and the letter and the spirit of the law. Sam, a delicate political analyst, thank you very much for joining us and for your contribution. My pleasure. Thank you for staying with us. We'll take our report now. And when we return, I'll be giving you my take. Do stay with us. The convener of the revolutionary protest, Omoyele Shuwore, will be rearranged on Thursday, February 13th on fresh charges. This was concluded after Justice Ijoma Ojuku adjourned the case following the resumption of Shuwore's trial on Wednesday at the Federal High Court in Abuja. The prosecution, A.K. Alilu, informed the court that the Office of the Attorney General of the Federation, AGF, has taken over the prosecution of the case and has filed fresh and amended charges. Alilu added that they are yet to effect service of the amended charges on the defendants. The prosecution is always not uh, ready to proceed, coming up with one excuse after the other. And if you are following the trend, uh, maybe before we finish this case, Shure will become uh, a millionaire because uh, each time they ask for adjournment, it is at a cost. You know, which is not coming from their pocket, it's coming from uh, taxpayers' money. That's the way they are wasting taxpayers' money, because it's not coming from their pocket. All the VAT, VAT that they are increasing to 7.5 or whatever, this is the kind of nonsense they will be using it for. Don't forget on the 6th of December, an issue cropped up in court when uh, the learned Sikh uh, Femi Fala insisted that the proof of witness statement, they have lined up their wit witness statement, but the documents that they have on their witness statement are redacted statements, summary statements. So we have asked them, please serve these documents or not, that they have not done. Tomorrow we'll be in court. We did not apply for adjournment. We were supposed to be before the court yesterday, we are here today, and we are also going to be in court tomorrow. What we asked for wasn't an adjournment, but the fact to, we asked for time to serve the amended charge and proceed to, arra to arraignment. That's what we asked for. So, well, the defense themselves never asked for the for cost, but we we'll take a next reaction regarding the issue of cost. But the fact is that we are back to court tomorrow for the purpose of arraignment on the amended charge. While the Apex Court might have nullified the election of David Leon on the grounds that his deputy presented false information to the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, in aid of his qualification for the November 16th governorship election in the state, the grounds for his sack are shaky and I think his deputy should have been sacked and prosecuted for forgery instead. The truth remains that we cannot have peace and security when we do not have good governance and justice, because without justice we can't have good governance. 
The royal fathers have for centuries managed the affairs of their territories before government relegated them to the background after the 1914 amalgamation. It's about time these monarchs rise to the occasion, speak out and partner with stakeholders and the security agencies in the fight against insecurity and save the country. The call by the Sultan of Sokoto asking the monarchs to speak out should be heeded. Nigeria is in dire need of leadership that will save our country and put it on the right trajectory. Traditional rulers must speak the truth to power and demand that governance takes place with their communities. They wield a lot of influence and should not be a willing tool in the hands of politicians who are not keen on serving the people that voted them into power. That's our show for tonight. Join us tomorrow, same time. Do stay well.